Thanks, Steve. Well, again, good morning and welcome to Vision Calvary Chapel. If you have not yet checked out the Vision Calvary Chapel app, uh, be sure to do so. It's free to download. All of the major updates finally took place, so it's a completely refreshed app, and it looks amazing. It's, able, it's a, a great tool to be able to grow in your relationship with the Lord. There's the Bible app in there. There's audio and video archives. There's announcements, so if you miss an announcement or you wonder what's going on and you like to find out more info, it's all found in the church app free to download today. Uh, Be sure to take advantage of it. And I'm thrilled by how it turned out because it took so long with working with the changes in the app store uh, and the requirements for uh, developers that it has finally arrived. So be sure to check that out. If you have your Bibles, would you please open up to 1 Peter chapter 3. Lord willing, we'll be covering verses 8 through 22 today, and this is entitled, this this message is entitled, A Suffering That Overcomes. Now, one of the themes that we've been looking at through uh, this letter of Peter is the power to overcome through different means, all working through the Holy Spirit, through hope in the Lord, through humility, and even through suffering. We'll see that you have the ability to overcome anything that may be thrown your way. And if that's not good news, I don't know what is. Because in this life, we face all kinds of trials, all kinds of difficulties, all kinds of odd and weird situations that we may find ourselves in. And the good news is, is that God's word covers it all. And so today, we continue our study through the book of 1 Peter. Last week, if you missed our study, we concluded our three-part series entitled A Humility That Overcomes as we looked at our primary relationship with our spouse. And in particular, it had to do with an unbelieving husband and a believing wife. And so if you're working through or navigating through some difficult times or you just want to be better equipped on what God has to say regarding the marital relationships, you're not going to want to let last week's study go by without listening to it or watching. But today, in summary, Peter will, bring in, will be bringing everything that we've been studying over the last few weeks together. And I don't know about you. Let me ask you this question. How many of you here today love when God blesses you? I hope all your hands go up. Yes, I love when God blesses me. If God so chooses to bless me, which he does regularly, there are no complaints on my end. But I think that we would all agree with, yeah, I love when God blesses me. Uh, Granted, sometimes God's blessings don't look the way we think they should look. And we think, well, if God really was blessing me, then it would carry itself out in this way because that's what I would think God's blessings would look like. In actuality, often it is the case where God knows more than you know. And he blesses you accordingly with things that he knows are for your good and that are the best for you. You know, I remember hearing a young boy pray as his mom told him that he needed to start praying for others more than for things for just himself. You know, it's very easy to get into a rut, as you know, when you're praying, where, Lord, I pray that you do this for me and that for me, and I ask for this for myself and that for myself. And so as the mom heard the style of prayers that her young boy was praying, uh, very wisely, she said, you know, it's a good idea to not only just ask for things for yourself, Uh, And and to ask that God would bless you, but to pray for other people as well. You know, it's so easy to be so self-focused, even through our time of prayer, that we neglect praying for other people. And so his prayer went like this, and I quote, Dear God, please bless my friends, bless my classmates, bless my parents, my teachers, my coaches, my neighbors, and Lord, bless my whole family, but bless me more, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. God's blessings are a wonderful thing, and I have no problem praying for God to bless you. And I wonder how often we pray just like that little guy prayed, Lord, bless them, but just bless me more than you bless them. See, God's blessings are a wonderful thing, 
And though they're given ultimately by God's grace, there are certain practical things that we can do in order to receive God's blessings. And so, if we were to put out a questionnaire which said something, or asked something rather, hey, would you like to receive God's blessings? Check yes or no, and you check yes. Would you be willing to follow certain guidelines given by God in his scriptures so that you might receive those blessings? You now have the opportunity to check yes or no. And so today, we're going to be seeing as Peter shares how you can practically set yourself up for God's blessings. Now listen, this isn't a prosperity doctrine where, hey, if you do this, that, and the other thing, everything in your life is going to be perfect. We know that not to be true already, for Jesus said, in this world, guess what? You'll have tribulation. But he said, be of good cheer, he has overcome the world. But the Lord does give us guidelines and he gives us principles and he gives us commandments and he gives us directives so that we might be blessed by him. And so that's what we're going to be looking at today as we begin in verse 8 of 1 Peter chapter 3. Peter writes and says, finally, all of you in the church, you believers, be of one mind, having compassion for one another, love as brothers, be tenderhearted, be courteous. Be of one mind here. This is one of the most powerful and key components of the efficacy of the church. See, when the church, when we as Christians are united in representing Jesus, when the church is united in equipping the saints and reaching the lost, you see a very, very powerful church. When a church is divided, however, it cannibalizes itself. I mean, just think about your family or your extended family. Bring it down to the personal level for you today. Think about your family in a way that you have a, maybe you have a grievance with one another. Maybe you have a problem with somebody in your family. It could be your spouse. It could be your brother or sister. It could be your children. It could be an aunt or an uncle or a cousin. And then what happens when you start having problems within the family? You know what a nightmare that is. Every family gathering now, what a nightmare. You're planning a gathering. You're getting together for a birthday. You're visiting for the holidays. You know, it's difficult. Isn't it difficult when you know that they'll be there? They'll be there. And then you go through it back and forth with your wife. Like, this is going to be so uncomfortable. This is going to be so awkward. I don't even want to see them. Why do we even have to go to this thing? You know, when your introverted self starts regretting your extroverted self's plans that they've made, and you're like, wait a second, I just don't want to do this. You know, sometimes Ruth and I will go back and forth about, oh, you know, we're going to go and do this. And then in the last second, I may say, I don't think I actually want to do that anymore. I don't know if any of you can relate to that. Maybe when you have a grievance with somebody in your family, you exclude them or they exclude you. And then you miss out on the valuable time that you are to have as a family. See, the same goes for the church, our church family. And for this reason, Satan loves to bring division within the church. Now, when Paul, uh, excuse me, when Peter writes, be of the same mind, he's not meaning that every person in the church should be a clone of someone else. You don't need to be somebody else. What this does mean is that there's to be the mind of Christ working in the individuals of the church. One mind of Christ through the different members of the body of Christ. So we ask ourselves, how would Jesus respond? How would Jesus feel about this? How should I react in light of the heart of the Lord? See, the mind of Christ as described in Philippians chapter 2 speaks of humility, the humility of Jesus even to the point of death on the cross. The heart of Christ, as described in John 3, speaks of an unconditional love of Jesus that was shown by his death on the cross. But death to self is a painful way to go. Dying to your own wants and your own needs, what you want to do, what you feel like doing, what brings you joy or happiness or pleasure, dying to yourself is very, very painful. But guess what? It brings about a resurrected life and great blessings from God to accompany it. And so Peter writes to the church that they're to walk humbly before the Lord and to show compassion to one another. 
Now, if you're in the flesh, and if you're wondering what the flesh means, it's just the Bible's way of describing your sinful nature. And so when you hear me or another pastor state something, well, that's a work of the flesh, it's talking about your sinful nature. And so if you're in your flesh, or when you're not having the mind or the heart of Jesus, it's extremely difficult, and might I even add, annoying, to be patient and to be loving and to be tenderhearted and to show compassion to other people. If we are of one mind, that mind of Christ, showing compassion to one another will be able to work, we'll be able to work with those that are in the church that are very different from who we are. So when he says have one mind, it's having the one mind of Christ. It's not being a clone, like I mentioned, of somebody else. Now listen, honestly, we don't need more than one of us in the world. That is good enough. And those of us that know us know that one of us is enough for everyone. Yet we find that a church that is united is one that is able to have differing opinions as far as methodology might be concerned. Differing opinions on the methods employed by the church, but they're fully, fully supportive of the mission of the church. To teach the word, to equip the saints, to preach the gospel, knowing that Jesus builds his church. Yet, there are those that are inside the church, and maybe we know some of them, that would like to critique the way things are done. Like one group criticized. Like, this is a, a very, very true, funny story in some respects, and maybe it's more hilarious since it wasn't happening to me or to you, but they criticized D.L. Moody's approach to evangelism. They were really upset by the way that he sought to share the gospel, to which he replied, and I quote, it's clear that you don't like my way of doing evangelism. You raised some good points. Frankly, I sometimes do not like my way of doing evangelism, but I like my way of doing it better than your way of not doing it, end of quote. And it's true. I like the way that we're doing it better than the way you're not doing it. And there can be a critical spirit that is in the church where we instantly are judgmental of people or you know, start building out who we think that person may be or what a church may represent. Yet the church is to be united together in showing compassion to one another and loving each other as brothers and sisters in Christ, as family. And this truth of being a brother or sister in Christ is dismissed often, listen to me, because I feel like we use this term so, so loosely, brothers and sisters in Christ, and we become inoculated to what it truly means. This truth of being a brother or sister in Christ is dismissed often because of how many times we've heard it said that we're brothers and sisters in Christ. Listen, I have two brothers and one sister, and we've not always gotten along. And there have been times that we've been mean to each other and said things that were hurtful to one another. I mean, you know, I haven't because I was a perfect angel, but they've done those things. But guess what? We're still family. We're still family. We still love each other. But familiarity can bring a certain lack of compassion because we maybe don't struggle with those things that somebody else is struggling with in the church. And we lack empathy. We lose patience with people because they're getting on our nerves. And the lack of compassion, believe it or not, the lack of compassion is the stepping stone to resentment. Because we can find ourselves becoming hard-hearted towards the Lord because, guess what, we've become hard-hearted towards people. And instead of communicating the heart of the Lord and representing the mind of Christ and the heart of Christ, we've become now hardened and have now misrepresented the Lord to those around us. Now listen, I get it. We all have our own limits. Some of you might be redlining with certain people like, I, I'm really, really struggling with this. I don't know why, you know, there's not a lot of people that I, that I really don't get along with, but just this, this one person is just over and over and over again, just offending me. I just see them and I get upset. Yeah, sure, you have your own limit. I get that. 
But guess what? Those limits are not imposed upon you by the Lord, but rather our sinful nature. Our sinful nature sets the limits for how we will show compassion. Instead, for the follower of Jesus, it should be the Lord. This is why Peter, as a disciple of Jesus, mentioned to the Lord, many of you have heard this story, but so that we're all on the same page, I'll share it with you. It's from Matthew 18, 21 through 22. Peter came to Jesus, the same Peter whose letter we're studying today, came to Jesus and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? I wonder what Peter was thinking when he asked that question. I'm wondering what he thought when he presented the number seven. Like seven, that seems like a good number. Seven days in the week, you know, there's seven's the Lord's number, the number of completion, Lord. Seven's a good number, right? But Jesus said to him, I don't say to you to forgive up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. Now, Jesus wasn't saying, okay, you have 490 opportunities to sin against me, and then that's it. The point that he was making is that you should forgive, and you should forgive, and you should forgive. Because guess who forgives, and forgives, and forgives, and then forgives again? It's the Lord. The same forgiveness and compassion and tenderheartedness that the Lord has shown to us continually, we are to be showing to our brothers and sisters in Christ. But... If we allow ourselves to become hard-hearted towards others, then we will, guess what, no longer be tender-hearted towards them. And then you will discover that it will become increasingly more difficult for you to receive from the Lord. Get that. As your heart becomes hardened towards other people, it will become increasingly difficult for you to receive from the Lord because Husbands that don't dwell with their wives with understanding, giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel, as being heirs together of the grace of God, if they don't do that, their prayers are hindered. And so Peter writes that you're to be tender hearted or to show pity. And with all the heartache and suffering in the world, we can be closed off to the pain of others. And it's a defense mechanism in some respects because, man, there's a lot of pain out there. And if I start dwelling on it too much, then I start becoming depressed and feeling down. And I don't want to do that, so I kind of got to toughen up. And then you can end up having your thick skin lead to a hard heart. Yet with the Lord, you can have thick skin and still have a soft heart. You can still be strong in the face of adversity and still care for others. You can still walk through the valley of shadow of death and still be kind-hearted towards other people. You can experience difficulty and pain and suffering, and yet the Lord gives you understanding and empathy for other people. We have to be careful that we don't hinder the power of the Holy Spirit from working in our lives because if we do, then we will become hard-hearted. Yet if you allow the Lord to strengthen you and to keep your heart soft, you will find that that is the place that you want to be. And lastly, to be courteous. And this is more than minding your manners. You know, with our kids, when we raise them, we ask questions almost rhetorically like, hey, where's your manners? Are they hiding up in a tree somewhere? Where are they at? I haven't seen them in a while. Being courteous is more than having manners. This is actually speaking of being humbly minded in the original language. Listen to what Philippians 2.3 says. Paul's church to the letter, or his letter to the church in Philippi says, Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. This lowliness of mind was speaking of the humility of Christ. The humility that overcomes is the humility that comes from the Lord. Satan only gives evil. In case you haven't figured that out yet, there's your announcement for that. Most humans will give good as they get. Good for good and then bad for bad. You know, I'm going to give as good as I get. You do this to me, I do that to you. You treat me nice, then I treat you nice. But Jesus set the example of giving good to those who did evil. Peter, already in chapter 2, described how Jesus handled himself when he was reviled and mistreated. He didn't lower his standard of righteousness to the level of his accusers. 
And so if Jesus didn't lower his level of righteousness based upon the playing field of those around him, neither should we. We should be the example. The church should be the shining, guiding light of what it means to be holy. There are no other examples of what holiness is to look like on the face of this earth other than the church. That is you. That is your job. That is your calling to be holy as he is holy. And that's our duty to fulfill that responsibility. And so, in verse 9 we read, And not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, blessing. Knowing that you were called to this, that you may inherit a blessing. That you might get a blessing. That you're called to be like the Lord so that you might receive the blessing from the Lord. Remember your calling as a follower of Jesus. You are to follow his example and then others see Jesus in your example. In Ephesians chapter 4 verses 1 through 3, Paul writes and says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you, I beg you, to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness, gentleness, and long-suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring, to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Loneliness of mind. We don't need more arrogance in this world. We don't need any larger of doorways than we already have because your head will not fit through the door it currently is trying to get through. We need to have the mind of Christ who is God and humbled himself to the point of being a servant And then dying on the cross. In verses 10 through 12 of 1 Peter 3, Peter is going to be quoting from Psalm 34. If you'd like to read this later, you can. But in verse 10 it says, For he who would love life and see good days. I wonder if there are any of you here like that today that would say, you know what? I want to love life and see good days. Well, good. I do as well. And look at what it says in verse 10. Let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. Here you are now finding direction for how you receive the blessings of the Lord. If you want to live a good life and you want to see good days, These are practical things that you can do as a follower of Jesus. Refrain your tongue from speaking evil. Your lips from being deceitful. Turn from evil. Do what is good. Seek peace and pursue it. Now the tongue. It's a little part of the body. But it can say some things that get us into a whole world of trouble. And the words that we speak can either bring peace or they can be inflammatory. And some of us might be a bit too careless when it comes to the words we speak. We say things that are insensitive, that are mean, maybe even ill-timed. We say things when we should be quiet. We say things that turn molehills into mountains. We say things that throw gas on the fire. Listen to what Proverbs 21-23 says, Whoever guards his mouth and tongue keeps his soul from troubles. So the words we say, or, or how about the emails you send, or the text messages that you drop, these comments all have power. The posts that you post on social media or YouTube, the things that you speak or type, for that matter, can defile you. Now listen, it may come natural to say the things the way that you say them, but do not fail to consider that what is natural is in its fallen state, and that fallen state, according to the Scriptures, is set on fire by hell. In Proverbs 26, 21, it says this, Where there is no wood, the fire goes out. And where there is no tail-bearer, strife ceases. As charcoal is to burning coals and wood to fire, so is a contentious man to kindle strife. The words we say. There should be no evil coming from our lips. Period. It doesn't matter what the other person is doing. We don't lower ourselves to their standards because we have a higher standard. 
We've talked about this in different levels. We have a higher standard for our relationships. We have a higher standard for our conduct. We have a higher standard for our communication. We have a higher standard for even how we endure suffering or receive praise or progress in our calling. In Romans chapter 12, verses 18 through 21, it says, If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourself, but rather give place to wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink, for in so doing you will heap coals of fire on his head. And then in Romans 12, 21, it says, Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. We need more men and women today, especially, I would say, especially in the church, to do good. There's a lot of evil out there. And it's running rampant. That's why we need to have the Lord raise up that standard, and that standard is you. You are the wall that goes up in defense of evil trying to encroach upon your personal relationship with the Lord. The evil trying to insert itself into your family, your home dynamic, into your neighborhood, into your county, your state, and your country, into this world. You are to be the salt and the light. But when the church is divided against itself, when there's little factions and backbitings and, hey, did you hear about this person over there? And then can you believe that they did this? All of a sudden, you start to see the works of the devil taking place instead of the work of the Holy Spirit. Because it says in verse 12, if you're to refrain yourself from speaking in such a way that is not glorifying to God, you'll find That if you're to speak the truth in love, you'll find God's blessings. You'll find his favor. Because in verse 12, look at 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 12. It says, the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Now, if you're doing evil, if you're here today doing evil, If you're watching online and you're doing evil, regardless of whether or not you think that you're getting away with it, the Lord is against you, the Bible says. Sin can be pleasurable for a moment, and you might think you're getting away with it. You know, you haven't been struck with lightning yet. There hasn't been a piano that's fallen on your head from the sky, so God must be turning a blind eye. No, the Lord sees very clearly, and he is set against you. And that is a battle that you will not win. The Bible says the soul that sins will surely die. God is the victor. He has already won. Yet, if you were to come to a place today and say, you know what, I have sinned. I have fallen short of God's perfect standards. And you recognize that even what you're doing is wrong because you have a God-given conscience in addition to God-given commandments. You will find that God can meet you exactly where you're at and forgive you and cleanse you and make you righteous in his sight and then his eyes will be upon you in a favorable way and his ears will be open to your prayers. But if you're doing that which is wicked, God sees the way that you're treating the righteous and as the righteous are being persecuted, God hears their prayers. That is a word for the church today and maybe you need to hear that specifically. God hears your prayers prayers. He sees the oppression. He sees the attacks. He knows that you're calling out to him, and he is sending forth that which you need when you need it. And if you're righteous, you're being treated in an evil manner, God sees, God hears, and he knows those that are coming against But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you are blessed and do not be afraid of their threats nor be troubled. Satan loves to appear larger than life. He loves to make you feel intimidated with this huge theatricality of evil and power and ominous strength that you can't overcome. Who are you, you little tiny person? You can't do a single thing. Well, that's right. I can't do anything, but I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. How about that? 
How about I walk in faith and not by sight? I base my relationship with the Lord upon facts and not feelings. How about I step into whatever it is that God has called me to be faithful in, and I do so in the strength and the power of the Holy Spirit? Church, are you with me with that today? That's what the Lord's called us to do. Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. And God's not given you a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. Who is going to harm you if you're doing what's good? Sure, there might be people coming after you. They might hate you because you have a stance for righteousness. And even if you should suffer, Peter says, you're blessed. Even if you suffer. And that's easier said than done, I admit. Because there have been things that were so far outside of my control that I sat on my little bench in my backyard and just looked out into the trees and I'm like, Lord, I have no idea what in the world I can even do about this. This is bad, Lord. Can you please help? Can you please protect? And guess what? He did. And he does. And he'll continue to do so. All you have to do is read the Gospels or the book of Acts to understand the personal insight that Peter is actually sharing with us through his letter. This isn't like I know theoretically he was a disciple of the inner circle of Jesus. He saw everything Jesus did, everything that he had to endure, the persecution, the threats of death, eventually even as Jesus laid down his life for the sins of the world. And see, one of the things that can typically happen with people is that the further they get from the original content, the less they resemble what they should. Meaning that with the original disciples that were there with Jesus 24-7, when Jesus ascended to heaven, they were now going to be the ones that were going to have to put into practice every single thing that they had been taught by Jesus and had learned from him. And I believe that what's happening in our country and even in this church is that the Lord is raising up people that were previously not in a position to lead or to influence or to impact change. But God is now raising up a next generation of those that are going to lead the charge into the future until the day that Jesus comes home. And history shows us that every generation that is removed from the great work of God tends to drift in the opposite direction or even to reinterpret the original content. Peter, though, had already put into practice what he was preaching or writing in this letter. In Acts 5, Peter and the other disciples were arrested They were beaten for their faith in Jesus. This is the same chapter where Peter boldly proclaimed that it was better for them to obey. They had called for the apostles and beaten them. They commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus. And then they let them go. So they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. And daily in the temple and in every house, they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. And so the religious leaders beat them. They threw them into prison. They threatened them. And it said that Peter and the other disciples rejoiced. Hey, we're just like Jesus. Jesus was persecuted for this very same thing. Righteousness. This wasn't something Peter was just saying hypothetically. He lived it. He was there. And that's why there was so much power, I believe, when we read, not only guided by the Holy Spirit, but there was the personal, practical element. He wasn't telling other people, don't be afraid of their threats or be troubled. While being afraid and troubled himself, no, he went through it, he lived it, he found that the truth was the truth, and now he's communicating it to the church. And who is he, verse 13, will harm you if you become followers of what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you're blessed. And do not be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled. 
Did you realize that every great man or woman throughout history that has been used by God in any significant way has always been threatened? Always. There is not one exception to that rule throughout history. The reason why evil will threaten righteousness is because evil is threatened by righteousness. And when you stand up, and when you have a purpose, and you're not afraid to make it known, you will find that evil trembles. And so then they get ugly, and then they get dirty, and then it becomes vicious, and then it's just awful. And then you're like, why did I do this? Why did I get myself... saying about me and all of a sudden they're threatening and they're going to sue and they're going to do this and the other thing and Peter says don't be troubled by this I've been there God always takes care of it don't lower your standards don't be like if they want to get dirty I'll show you dirty you have a representation you have a reputation. That representation should be one of Christ. That reputation should be one of a man or a woman that is filled with the Holy Spirit and exercises wisdom. Don't lower yourself to their standards. Peter would even say, I believe, if we put a modern day spin on the vernacular, hey, I've been there and done that. The Lord is true to his word. So don't be afraid of their threats. Look at verse 15. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Peter was into apologetics. That's the defense of the faith. The defense, the defense of his faith in Jesus and guess what? Again, he practiced what he preached. It was recorded for us in Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 3, Acts chapter 4, and Acts chapter 5. Peter defended the faith. He stood up boldly and proclaimed with sound reason and teaching and instruction and the wisdom of the Holy Spirit exactly why it made sense that Jesus Christ is Lord. Be ready. Be ready to give a defense. That's why when you come to church and you open your own Bible or your own Bible app, and you're studying it, and you're reading it. That's why when you go about the rest of your day, and you spend time reading the Word of God on Mondays, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, Thursdays, Fridays, Saturdays, and Sundays, you'll find that the Lord is now equipping you. It says in verse 16, having a good conscience that when they defame you as evildoers, those who revile your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed. For it is better, if it is the will of God, to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. Do you realize, as we conclude today, do you realize that God's grace is revealed, might I add, in overabundance during times of persecution and fear? Where you're physically and mentally and emotionally drained because you're concerned or worried or even fearful of the things that are happening around you. But let me ask you this. As you have to work out your own relationship with God, why are you afraid? Why are you discouraged? Put your hope in God today. He'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. His ears are not closed to your prayers. His arm's not too short that he can't reach and save. See, there is a temptation for the church, for the Christian, to act out of fear instead of confidence in the Lord. To make a decision based out of fear instead of making a decision based out of confidence in God. And I'll tell you, 10 out of 10 times that you make a decision based out of fear will be a decision that you will regret. But you never need to be afraid of anything. Anything. Guess what? God, let me ask you this quick question. Do you think God is afraid of anything? No. And you're his son. You're his daughter. So do you think God is afraid of anything on your behalf? Like, oh man, I'm really fearful for what's going to happen with these guys. No. God hasn't given you a spirit of fear. He's given you power, but you forget it sometimes when you rely on your emotions or your thoughts. Be careful about that. 
we stress, we worry about, what will I ever do? But as Peter did, show, so should we. Strengthen yourself in the Lord. Be ready to give an answer for the hope that lies within you. Listen to this stat. These statistics are crazy. It's from the Institute of, the, of Biblical Research. They said that one day a week of reading your Bible. Now, they had a focus group for this, and honestly, there's some pretty pointed questions in this uh, focus group that were given. But they said if you read the Bible one day a week, it almost has no effect. Tangibly, mentally, emotionally. Two to three days a week, negligible. Like you start to notice there's, there's something like turning over in your life as a follower of Jesus. But listen to this statistic. Four plus days a week of reading the Bible would make you 228% more likely to share your faith. 407% more likely to memorize scripture, 59% less likely to view pornography, and at least 30% less likely to struggle with loneliness, depression, and anxiety. So church, reading the Bible is how you get ready. But yet there it is, dusty on our nightstand. I don't really have time for it. Quick, open the Bible app. What's the verse of the day? I have two and a half seconds to spare. But if you know what the Bible says, you can live accordingly. You can live accordingly. And do you know what wonders living according to the Bible will do for your conscience? Your conscience is a very, very powerful thing. And when you live your life according to God's word, you're not only pleasing to the Lord, you're not only setting yourself up for success, you're not, able, you're not only able to endure sufferings in, in a great fashion, you're also walking before God purely, you're walking before God in holiness, and you have a clear conscience in the midst of trials. Because this is the way that it is, is it not? Where we go through something that's difficult or painful or problematic and we think, oh man, you know, I sinned in a major way last week and now I'm just in a bad spot. I can't believe this. You know, I, I'm having to endure all of these things because, you know, I gave into that temptation or, you know, I didn't do what I was supposed to be doing. And there's an insecurity there. And we wrestle with it even as seasoned believers. However, if you have a clear conscience before God and that you've been living according to God's word and you go through that same trial, that same problem hits you, hits you, you know, square on, you will have so much more confidence, so much more power, so much more awareness spiritually that all things work together for the good of those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. An awareness that the Lord uses these things to strengthen me because I'm, I'm not yet where I need to be. All of a sudden, instead of being burdened by the problem, my eyes have now been opened that I'm identifying with who Jesus is. I must be doing something right. And I must be doing something that's effective. And the Lord is the one that is walking me through all of this. And I say hallelujah and amen. And even though my flesh hates it, my sinful natures crying out saying this is ridiculous and how could God allow this to happen I override those things by the lordship of Jesus in my in my life and I recognize that I walk by faith and not by sight and that changes everything and I have a clear conscience before God and see it says in verse 18 for Christ also suffered once for sins the just for the unjust that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit. Do you see what Peter's saying here? The suffering, the pain, we're being crucified with Christ. It's now no longer I who live in this body. It's no longer I who identify as the Lord of my own life, the captain of my own ship. I recognize that the life that I now live in my body, I live through faith in the Son of God who loves me and gave himself for me. Lower my standard to be unjust to those who are unjust. I am to be just like Jesus. Now I find that now there's an opportunity for ministry. 
Now there's an opportunity for protecting my reputation as a follower of Jesus because there's not an evil thing that can be said because I haven't done anything that could be used against me. And ultimately, we find ourselves truly fulfilling our role as ambassadors for Christ wherever we're at. You go to Round Table Pizza and you pick up a pizza, you're an ambassador for Christ. You pop over to Albertsons, you're an ambassador for Christ. You head over to your work, you're an ambassador for Christ. You go play pickup ball at the park, you are an ambassador for Christ. Wherever you are at, any opportunity, any platform, you use to represent the Lord. And in verse 18, the supernatural key, if you will, for us today is found in the middle of verse 18 where it says that he might bring us to God. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. In case you were wondering who the just was and who the unjust were, we're the unjust, Jesus was just. And he laid down his life to bring us, the unjust, to God. So what's our role now in the world? To bring unjust people to salvation. To take those that were dead in their trespasses and in their sins by the way you represent the Lord in this life and bring them to the Lord. Some of us in our flesh, we might say, you know what, that guy bugs me one more time. He'll be seeing the Lord all right, but just not in the way he thought. That's not what he's talking about. Though you might feel like it, sometimes it's a good rule of thumb to not do everything you feel like doing. You're an ambassador. In Romans 8.18, Paul wrote, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. And there is a glory that is yet to be revealed in your life through suffering for righteousness. And additionally, there are those yet to be saved through you enduring suffering you get that? A glory to be revealed in your life through difficulty. And there are those that are going to get saved through you enduring difficulty. As you endure suffering, there is a suffering that overcomes. It's a holy suffering in the name of Jesus, empowered by Jesus for the glory of Jesus to reach people for Jesus. Look at what Jesus did through his death on the cross. He brought us into a personal relationship with the Lord. Our sinful natures were done away with, and we were born again by the Spirit. Hallelujah. Look at verse 19. It says, By whom also he went and he preached to the spirits in prison who formerly were disobedient, when once the divine long suffering waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight souls, were saved through water. Here in verses 19 and 20, don't worry, I'm not going to leave you hanging. I'm just going to say, and in closing, we're done there. It's an interesting text that Peter inserts here, and it can leave some wondering exactly what it means. Now, in Isaiah 61, and this is where we will come in for a close, there is a messianic prophecy concerning Jesus, which reads, Isaiah 61, 1, it says this, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound. Now, there are two main views that I'll point out to you this morning regarding the spirits in prison. The spirits in prison, view number one is this. They're human souls waiting for the redemption of Jesus. View number two, the spirits in prison are demons waiting for the judgment of Jesus. And most will take one of these two positions on interpreting what this passage means. But it's my personal opinion, and I do preface what I'm about to say as it is my personal opinion, that Jesus interacted with both. Now, you can read fully what I'm about to share in Luke 16 regarding a wicked rich man and a righteous poor man, both dying and... The rich man also died, who was wicked, and was buried. And being in torment in Hades, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Then he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. So you had a rich man who was wicked and you had this poor man, Lazarus, 
who was familiar with this rich, wicked man. And he says, as he looks across this cavern, he says, send Lazarus to dip his finger in water and touch my tongue because I'm in torment. But Abraham said, son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things. You would gain the whole world and lose your very soul. This is what he is saying. And there are some that are righteous that suffer many things. And besides all of this, it says in Luke 16, 26, between us and you there is a great gulf fixed so that those who want to pass from here to you cannot, nor can those pass from there to us. And so it would appear that this passage that predates Jesus' death on the cross, that Hades had two compartments. You had a place for the wicked where they were tormented, and you had a place for the righteous where they were comforted called Abraham's bosom. The place of torment was where the unrighteous went. And once you were assigned a final location, there was no changing it. As Abraham said, you can't cross from here to there and you can't go from there to here. In 1 Peter 3.19, we read that Jesus preached or heralded to those in hell. You look at verse 19 of 1 Peter 3, by whom also Jesus went and preached to the spirits in prison. This happened sometime between Jesus' death on the cross and his resurrection. So Jesus did descend into that place known as Hades, where there were two compartments for those that were righteous and those that were evil. And Jesus proclaimed his victory over sin, triumphing over the devil and his demons. And additionally, with that same announcement, like I said, my personal opinion, that it's not one or the other, that it was both, both uh, those that were demonic and evil and those that were righteous, those that were in Abraham's bosom were led out of that place into heaven. Those that were righteous that died predating Jesus' death on the cross. Ephesians 4, 8 through 10 says, Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Now this he ascended, what does it mean? That he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth. He who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. And so, there's a case to be made that in the New Testament, the word for spirit refers to angels or demons here in verse 19. If this indeed is the case, then this would be referring to a terrible time before the flood where there was a mingling of demonic and human natures. And we could go off on a rabbit trail on this, but that's for another time. But we'll stick to what we know for certain. In verse 20, who formerly were disobedient, when once the divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight souls, were saved through water. There is also an anti-type which now saves us. Baptism. Not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so Peter himself says that this is a typology, an example Noah and his family, they were saved from the judgment of God through the ark upon the water. The flood, believe it or not, if you think about this literally, washed away the sin and the wickedness of the world. But Peter doesn't leave it there. He is very quick to point out that it's not an act of being submerged in water that saves you, as he states in verse 21, but salvation that is represented by baptism. Now, there are churches today that teach that if you are not baptized, you are not saved. This is untrue. That is false. Think about this example. You give your life to Jesus. Maybe it was here. Maybe it was at a Billy Graham crusade or a Harvest crusade or in the privacy of your own home. You give your life to Jesus, and then on your way to the baptism, God forbid, you get in a car accident and die. Do you go to heaven or to hell? Faith in Jesus saves you. Baptism does not. Baptism is something that we're commanded by God to do, that if we're saved and truly believe in Jesus as our Lord and Savior, then you should be baptized. Just a couple weeks back, we had a number of people that were publicly displaying, expressing, communicating, that they identify with the death, the burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. 
And so, we see having a good conscience towards God is a great thing. In verse 22, it says, Who has gone into heaven, Jesus, that's his name, and he is at the right hand of God. Angels and authorities and powers have been made subject to him. That's your heavenly perspective. God is in control of all things, even your predicament that you may find yourself in today. So walk humbly before the Lord, and he'll lift you up. Rely upon him, he'll give you strength. Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. So don't be afraid, don't worry about the threats. You do what God's called you to do, and he'll take care of all the details. Let's pray.